I do hope you will understand this very difficult decision which was made for the most compelling family reasons. This is a particular wrench for me as I was hugely looking forward to the prospect of seeing friends old and new from China, India and elsewhere. However, I very much hope that Oxford will be able to, return, or to offer a return match soon, in particular after we open our new University China Centre this autumn, a centre that will be Europe's largest dedicated physical centre for the study of China. It would be wonderful if India-China relations can be part of the conversation that takes part there. And I hope that many of the friends gathered here today will be part of that further discussion. I know that with the distinguished figures involved from several countries, it will be an immensely stimulating workshop. So I'm sorry that I, I have to leave you to sort of muse upon what Rana might have said about why 1945 matters once again in shaping China-Indian uh, relations, but um, perhaps we can, we can give that thought later on in the workshop. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and um, uh, in fact, part of that is covered by uh, Ambassador Kishandana's uh, presentation. Uh, and uh, if we knew this in advance, we would have circulated Rana's paper uh, from the last conference. Uh, well, uh, therefore we have more time for discussion. Uh, and uh, so, you know, it's very interesting, uh, two uh, streams of conversation between India and China, the two papers presented. Uh, and we, for the last one year, we have been busy, uh, thanks to the Tagore uh, uh, Nobel Centenary, uh, hundred years since Tiger got the Nobel Prize, we had uh, five major conferences, uh, uh, three in China, one in Shantideketan and one in Delhi, uh, and several people here were present uh, in, uh, in this. So that was one kind of conversation, the civilizational yeah. conversation. And uh, the intellectual, social science, and uh, uh, the uh, thought level, serious thought level conversation which Steve McKinnon has been researching uh, for the last over 50 years <laughs> and uh, now the, uh, this uh, link to Chananshan project. Uh, and the conversation that Kishan Rana talked about, some of which must be covered in the Chantu conference, Kishan, uh, his paper, you remember. Um, and. Uh, uh, you know, that's the interesting conversation among leaders. Uh, and look at this, you know, how um, Churchill is reacting and Churchill's perspective on governing India, the colony, uh, we all know. Therefore, we have these three streams of conversations. Uh, but the common point made by both uh, Steve McKinnon and Kishan Rana is that there have been ruptures. Uh, and uh, why did that take place? Um, some explanation uh, Steve McKinnon gave um, for information uh, that uh, Steve presented through his presentation today and uh, in some of the other writings. Uh, and we had um, this Arunav Ghosh made a presentation there two months ago. Oh, he did. Uh, on. Uh, on Mahalana Basin yeah, China. I, I've heard him once. And the statistical system mm. formation. And we had uh, Garnet, Anthony Garnet, in the first Oxford workshop uh, on the evolution of statistical system and uh, uh, the Mahalana Basin. You know, so he's also covering. Unfortunately, uh, he didn't get a visa to come. Uh, and he knew about it only four days ago. Uh, and it was too late. Uh, to do anything. So what I'm saying is uh, uh, the social science communication uh, which was a very important input into policy making and you had some uh, something to say on the impact of these two uh, minds on the framing of the second five year plan of India in case of Marlon Lewis who was the author of the second five year plan and uh, uh, to what extent Haranshan had any impact at all, and according to your assessment, uh, he was critical already of that uh, plan. Uh, so that was one stream. Uh, Kishandana's hypothesis is that uh, if there had been closure, understanding of the um, of the uh, 
of the actual process that was evolving in China, uh, in Yan'an, if uh, Nehru had visited and met Mao Zedong that early, maybe it would have had a different impact on him. Uh, so uh, you have various explanations. Uh, so we have now a uh, wealth of material, and uh, Nirmala, who is working on the National Archives, and is going to present one. And we have much earlier, uh, we'll have a paper on uh, the, uh, you know, this Gadadhar Singh uh, project. You'll, you'll hear that from the Voxer, an Indian eyewitness to the Voxer uh, uprising, and his diary and his book. Uh, they have just finished the project on that. So all these are, you know, framing our project uh, on uh, sort of restructuring and enlarging the nature of the uh, dialogue. The civilizational, the social scientific, intellectual, and the diplomatic and foreign affairs. Uh, therefore, all those specific issues that we are <coughs> studying, and 62, Mahatma and the diplomatic relations, the course of normalization, now are better placed in this larger perspective. So, thank you very much. Now, um, <coughs> we have uh, half an hour, um, almost. Discussion. Yes, yes. Uh, this is uh, one, one time. The, the uh, microphone is not on. Yeah. Um, my, I'm I'm going to uh, actually, I'm trying to uh, respond or communicate with uh, Professor. McKinnon's um, presentation because uh, uh, you know that I'm coming from uh, I'm working uh, in China Foreign Affairs University and I teach the lecture of uh, uh, Modern Chinese Foreign Relations um, uh, course and uh, the things that you mentioned in especially the question that you raised up in the very end actually uh, hit upon my heart <laughs> so I have to say something about that um, you uh, said that uh, you raised up the question of why uh, some, uh, for example, uh, the Chinese or uh, Chinese Indian intellectual link, links, or even political social links, or much closer uh, in the 20s, uh, first or mm, mid 20th uh, century up to, and and it then became uh, weak. Can we argue for that? Um, in the uh, say uh, after the uh, founding of uh, communist China, after forty nine, and um, uh, as much as I know, um, we have to first and foremost to uh, talk about or think about the strategic thinking of the uh, decision makers of the communist party in the um, very founding period of that time, and uh, perhaps everyone knows about the. Uh, three uh, strategies, strategies for guiding in, in, uh, or foreign relations um, of communist China in the well, published actually uh, actually circulated in the inner circle in 1951 by Premier Zhou as um, linked to one side build up a new kitchen and, and that other thing but building up a new kitchen actually really has um, well every sentence has something um, very close uh, impact, uh, direct impact on both domestic politics and international work. And I'm emphasizing on this leading, uh, building a new kitchen. Because building a new kitchen has uh, two sides of the story. One side is external, it's towards the, um, say, uh, colonialization or, or kind of a very shameful imperialist uh, history. Of, uh, of China, that we say goodbye to that by leaning to one side. And um, uh, another thing is to uh, internal, both decision making, like a uh, uh, concentration of power to the to the to the central party, and at the same time re-establishment uh, of uh, the diplomatic bureaucracy. And this has very direct impact on Chen Haisheng's. Uh, um, career, I mean, <laughs> uh, or political, uh, diplomatic career, uh, to 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 
large extent, and that is why he was sent to Wai Jiao Shui Hui rather than to foreign ministry. And uh, wow, well, um, I I might uh, uh, say that um, I do agree with you uh, to some extent. If Chen Hanshen were born 60 years later, <laughs> might play a more significant role. But the question would be, uh, do can we have person like Chen Hanshen? Um, in 60 years' time after the founding of Communist China. So this is another quest, uh, another story. But um, in, regarding, in regarding to the 50s and uh, 50s, or, or kind of uh, 49 to 56 or 7 or to 8, why he still had chance you know, to be consulted and, and worked for, for, for the, for the uh, diplomatic at least um, uh, policy uh, to China, uh, it has really also to the um, uh, kind of, uh, especially 53 to 56, the so-called peaceful coexistence, and also to the end of the Korean War, the, the, the kind of uh, uh, both to domestically and externally, China is changing, or kind of adjust, adjusting, uh, finding the way of, uh, of uh, reshaping its policies. But it was really a traditional period. And as you see after 57, especially after late 57, I wrote an article on that. But it's not on uh, Sino-Indian uh, um, or Asian relations. It's really much linked to uh, Soviet, uh, the, the, the crisis and the uh, Eastern Euro European crisis. It's, it's also very much linked to domestic political or policy adjustments. And uh, you mentioned in, in your article. And um, uh, after that, uh, as Chen Hanshen also realized that he had to play it safe, because we all know about the opening, uh, oh, it's not opening door, but the uh, anti-rightist movement. But it's another story. <laughs> so, the, uh, uh, one thing I really uh, want to say is, um, historically speaking, uh, we might not find a way of changing the, the process, especially when we found, uh, I really like the, the title of yours, like Mr. Chance, So Opportunities. It reminds us with lost, uh, lost chances that uh, uh, warmly discussed in, in the US in the 50s and later on in the academia field. And um, later on, uh, I wonder whether uh, you know about the article, you must know about that, like um, uh, Zhong Gava and Chen Jian talking about the lost chances actually of communist China. And so the uh, very much implications of your research uh, on us from Chinese perspective is huge. Like. Uh, we, we have to uh, discuss more about the lost chances that <laughs> we might had, especially after we went through like 60 years of history. But it's, uh, currently, it's not really much studied. It's understudied topic. And thank you so much for, for carrying it on. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you want to respond now? Or, uh, well, uh, uh, a couple of maybe some other, but I, I do want to respond. Yeah, to, but let's uh, give some. Was a feature in uh, this twenties, uh, thirties, forties. Um, had been utilized as he had wanted to be utilized. Whether that really would have made a difference or not, because I think um, other compulsions were overwhelming. And um, even in this period of the 1940s, when there were all these links and going back and forth and all that, I think things were happening. In geopolitically speaking, things were happening, which were sort of played out in the 50s and uh, 60s. Even, uh, you know, I think uh, one part of Nehru's um, thinking, which we all like to talk about, and uh, which is important, which is his 
you know, it's not a fascination with China, kind of, you could say even love in some sense uh, for China. I mean, that was one part of his thinking, but there was another part of his thinking which was looking at India's place in uh, Asia, and there, one should not be in any doubt where he saw India's position was going to be, that was going to come into conflict with China, irrespective of whatever else he may have said. Similarly, throughout the 1940s, um, uh, Chiang Kai-shek's government also was very much, uh, you know, its frontier policy uh, was going to come into, you know, it had a, was pushing into those areas uh, and trying. So, and then, of course, there is a the whole external, which is why I think you can't look at India-China relations without the external factor. The whole uh, Cold War uh, scenario, which was building up after World War II, that profoundly affected uh, India-China relations. So, so while, I mean, this is something we have to weigh whether um, these personal connections, personal understandings that were there developed whether they could have actually played a role in the shape that India and China relations took. Well, this is just a question that uh, I just wanted to, uh, two on two minor points. You mentioned uh, uh, Professor McKinnon Luoja Alun, hmm. but Luoja Alun, of course, went to Taiwan, right? Yes. So, okay, so you you meant people like Luoja Alun, mm -hmm. not so much yeah. that. No, not him himself. Not him himself. <laughs> and about K.M. Panikkar, when you mentioned him as mm. an anti-communist, I wouldn't say so. Mm. I mean, if okay. you read his diary, his memoirs of uh, his experiences in China, he's very sympathetic. <laughs> I mean, uh, in fact, he's been criticized in India yeah, exactly. for having been too sympathetic and having... So this is just a minor point. Mm -hmm. Not a minor point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, Rapal, then uh, thank you, sir, and thank you, Steve, for your very detailed presentation. I have one specific question regarding N.G. Renga, because it is interesting that uh, Renga later on moved to the extreme, the people who criticized Nehru in the parliament. So, do you think that uh, the British officials who were guiding the, that group of people, some of them, how much they played a role, and what was their interest, especially due to Tibet and other issues. Have you got any more, uh, you can talk something more about, including that Sadar Patel's letter and issues like that. Thank you. And a British official role during the 40s? Late 40s and early 50s. Okay. Yeah. Because still the uh, India uh, and China signed that uh, Tibet, the withdrawal of trade mission. Yes. Uh, thank you, Steve. Okay. Thank you, uh, sir, for excellent papers. Uh, you know, since I am also studying, uh, you know, the issue which has come up here is why the relationship between India and China deteriorated uh, the moment the communists came into power in China. And that is the most crucial issue that, uh, you know, from Indian perspective that we need to do, study. Uh, since I am looking at uh, you know, the period of 40s and the American uh, presence, which began here in India uh, in 1942 uh, during the World War, uh, the China-India-Burma theater, uh, you know, and uh, as uh, Kishan Rana has mentioned in his paper, uh, you know, Chiang Kai-shek at that particular moment uh, was very close to India and he was largely close to India because he was also close to America at that stage. In uh, history and uh, uh, so there were great interactions and the pulls and the pressures between Churchill and uh, uh, Roosevelt at that stage were basically related to the fact that the U.S. intelligence agencies which, is, uh, which had established itself OSS in India at that particular stage was actually trying to uh, you know uh, trying to woo Congress and the Indian political leadership at that time Churchill did not like it of course at that stage. And uh, there was a meeting between Roosevelt and Churchill where, in fact, at one stage he, he said, I'm going to resign from public life if the U.S. does not s stop interfering uh, in the internal affairs of Indian, uh, in the Indian political landscape largely. Now, this was also a movement, uh, this is also the time when actually, you know, and I'm trying to uh, study this more, 
uh, uh, the role of uh, Henry Luce. Henry Luce was the uh, was heading the China lobby in America. He was the uh, 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 he was the owner of Time magazine, and the Life magazine, and the Fortune magazine. Uh, he was dead against uh, uh, Roosevelt, or for that matter, the Truman. Uh, you know, coming anywhere close to uh, 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 close to Mao, for that matter, or the communists. And he said that all efforts, U.S. efforts, need to be invested in Chiang Kai-shek. Now his wife. Uh, was actually Henry Luce's wife was also at that stage in 1940s, mid 1940s, also engaged with uh, uh, with the uh, uh, you know India Independence League in America. She was the one who was supporting the India Independence League at that particular stage. So these connections, uh, I feel, uh, in that particular stage, need to be uh, you know studied <coughs> in more greater detail to arrive at why the relationships actually, and Indian India-China relationship actually started deteriorating in 1950, the moment China entered Tibet. And uh, you know, the whole lot of lobby which was built up in India, and uh, uh, Ranga was a part of this, you know, uh, uh, Asoka uh, Mehta, uh, who was also uh, one of the person related, and they all formed Swatantra Party later, along with Rajagopalachari. So, in that sense, uh, you know, this is a very crucial period in the 40s, and America was trying to make its foothold in India at that stage. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, who is next? <coughs> okay, why don't you respond? <coughs> a lot of very interesting points uh, in the text of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, which had shifted, uh, uh, as, as you say, uh, it was the two. The forces were too strong uh, uh, for somebody like him uh, to to have a, a, a very a very great voice, and I and, and I see your point, uh, but I still think we should consider the, the possibilities. There, and, and I guess I have some questions back to you uh, and others uh, about the what if thing. Uh, I mean, there's a view too that Mao didn't think foreign relations were very important, you know, or is that right? In other words. The, I wanted to ask you about this business of the generals, all these military people, who had often limited it, formal education even. You know, a, a general in the Nanchang uprising was sent to, I forget, Indonesia or something. Anyway, but, but like this ambassador to India, which was a very important, the Tibetan issue, I mean, these things are very important, and, and, and uh, really were ineffectual. And, and, and it seems like, why did they make those kind of appointments? I mean, uh, uh, but uh, it comes maybe more from Mao than Joe and mine. I, I don't know. Uh, that he trusted these people and thought somebody else would never come back or something like that. I mean, I don't know. I'm speaking here a little bit from Chen Hansung's uh, point of view about it. Uh, uh, <clears throat> Chen Hansung is a man who gave himself to the international revolution, you know, starting in 1925. He believed in the, in, 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 the, in the Chinese Revolution and also international communism, basically. And so he was an idealist, a romantic, perhaps. Uh, and and uh, uh, so you can see his, he thought that a, there would be a more rational examination of, uh, of foreign policy. He was equally disappointed with, with the lack of statistical sophistication uh, in China, despite the availability of a means to, to really do uh, investigations in the countryside of what is reality, instead of inventing numbers and all those things that did happen, especially by the time of the second five-year plan. <coughs> uh, so I see, your, I see your point, and, and uh, I would like to discuss with you more about what was really going on in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in the 50s, because I don't know too much about it. I know it from his side only, really. and, and uh, uh, and I would be very interested to hear it uh, 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 more. Uh, uh, and uh, <clears throat> could he have made a difference? She raises a very good question. Uh, 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 and um, I, 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 I see the point, really. <laughs> uh, and probably he wouldn't have made much of a difference, I suppose, except maybe some nuanced, a more nuanced uh, uh, approach. Back to the Ranga, I would like to no, a little bit more like the question about the British officials in the larger role. I'm afraid I don't know too much about 
of what your reference is there, and I think the rest of the, you in the room do. Uh, but of course, the Tibetan issue was 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 important. Chen Hansung had done an investigation. I didn't mention it, but had done an investigation during the war on the border regions of uh, of, of Yunnan, uh, which involved Tibetans and so on. So he he actually had lived in those villages and wrote up a long report that was published. Uh, uh, eventually in Chinese, but uh, first in English. Anyway, so he, he was sensitive to the, to, to the issue. He wouldn't have probably agreed that, that uh, China should not go into Tibet, you know, absolutely. But uh, Chiang Kai-shek, of course, had this exactly, as, as somebody pointed out in their comments, uh, the last communication between Nehru and Chiang Kai-shek was about 1947 or something, when uh, uh, Nehru is talking about Tibet, and Chiang Kai says, nonsense. I don't want to talk to that man again. I mean, in, in other words, uh, the, the Chiang Kai-shek position was exactly the same. Uh, uh, you know, that's in that diary business that you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, and uh, so uh, that that issue, I guess we should we should frankly, from both sides, examine that issue more and more in the, in that in in that in that period. Uh, and of course, there's the U.S. role too. Uh, and. Uh, we haven't talked about it, but of course, uh, especially after uh, the Korean War, the, the U.S. and the Cold War, the U.S. is encouraging bad relations between uh, uh, India and China. Uh, <coughs> Dulles brothers uh, and, uh, uh, and so on. Uh, interesting what you said about uh, uh, the looses, and I think that's very important too. In, in, I'd like to talk to you more about uh, uh, I think that Roosevelt was, and they were Republicans, opposition to Roosevelt. Uh, so he was feeling pressure actually on his right to to support Indian independence. And that's I think the point you're making. I mean it was it was pressure from Luce that made him fire Stillwell, for instance, uh, you know, uh, uh, later in, in a lot of ways and so on. So that you you raise an interesting dimension, uh, I think. Well uh, anyway, I, I, I should stop. Yes.
Of course, it is very well known that Chiang Kai shek's position when it came to uh, China's position on the border issue was exactly the same as that of the Communist Party. But I personally have little doubt that it would have made for a profound attitudinal change vis a vis both the leaders of China as well as of India if that contact had taken place, but that's in the realm only of speculation. Uh, about Roosevelt and uh, Churchill, you know, it's not just, I want to say to uh, Mr. Atul Bhardwaj, I think, that it's not only that the, the quarrel or the, the uh, problem that uh, Roosevelt and Churchill had was over the activities of the uh, CIA or the OSS or the uh, efforts by the Americans to uh, move who uh, uh, the Congress leaders. Uh, here I have a quotation from Harry Hopkins from his diary, where he says, India was indeed the one subject on which the normal, broad-minded, good-humored, give-and-take attitude that prevailed between the two statesmen was top cold. It may be said that Churchill would see the empire in ruins and himself buried under them before he would concede the right of any American, however great and illustrious friend, to make any suggestion as to what he should do about India. It may be added that